Let's take our Bibles, let's turn together to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. We are in a series that I am calling Stand Firm. It comes out of the first imperative of seven imperatives in our text, Philippians 4, 1 through 9, the very first imperative to stand firm. And you remember, recall, an imperative is a command. And so Paul is commanding the Philippians to stand firm. That is our command today, to stand firm. Why is that? It's because we are in a spiritual battle. We need to keep that to the forefront of our minds, that we're not just casually moving through life, but there is a reality beyond our own, a spiritual dimension, that would love to see us fall. And so what does Peter tell us? Be sober-minded, be watchful, your adversary the devil prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Who is that someone? That's, that's you. And so what do we do? We stand firm. Now stand firm is the primary command in the text. You find this in verse 1 of chapter 4. And then as I mentioned, there are seven imperatives all together throughout this text. What Paul is doing is he gives us a command and then he doesn't just leave the command, he follows it with practical application. And so what we're doing is we're working through the rest of those imperatives and we're building an understanding of how to anchor ourselves to stand firm. We're calling these the six anchor points. Last week we looked at two anchor points that help us to stand firm. The first is purposeful unity. And we see this lived out for us in verse 2 and 3. Look there in your Bibles with me. Paul says, I entreat Judea and I entreat Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Now we took this passage apart and we learned that there were two women that were in the midst of a disagreement. And Paul in verse 3 calls upon a true companion. And I understand this to mean a, a, a literal person. He was calling upon a person in the church of Philippi, and he says, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Now the thing that stood out for us is that he proactively called these women to unity. Why is that? He did that because he understands the danger of disunity. Disunity destroys relationships, it destroys families, it also destroys churches. And so he's calling these two women to stand together under purposeful unity to resolve their conflict. Why? Because he knows their conflict could cascade throughout the entire church. He says if the church is going to stand strong, if you're going to stand strong, you must guard yourself against disunity. So he calls them to purposeful unity. The second anchor point then that we looked at was in verse 4, and that is to continually rejoice, to be people who continual, to, to, to be continually rejoicing. Verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Now this is the third imperative in our list. And we have to stop and we have to ask a very real question. We asked it last week. And that is, is this a realistic command? Can we truly be people who are rejoicing always? And what did we say? Well, we said, not if it's based on feelings. We cannot fulfill this command if we base it on our feelings. But it's absolutely realistic if our rejoicing is, notice the prepositional phrase, in the Lord. That's the key. He really takes us back to the central message of the book of Philippians. If you remember, we said joy is not dependent on our emotions, not dependent on our feelings, not dependent on our happiness that ebbs and flows. It's also not dependent on circumstances, what we find ourselves in. It's not dependent on any aspect of life. But happiness, uh, emotions, 
the, the movement of our life, those change to the point that are undependable. But what is dependable? What is it that creates true joy in the life of the believer? And it's this phrase right here, in the Lord. We said these were the two anchor points that we learned last week, a little bit of a review. Now we're going to move forward in verse 5 and following, and we're going to add two more to our understanding. Follow along with me in the text. I'm in Philippians 4, verse 5. He says, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. Finally, he says, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Today we're going to look at verse 5, 6, and 7 and see two more anchor points that Paul gives us to stand firm. The third is reasonable, or rather observable reasonableness, to be reasonable. Observable reasonableness. Now let me just break this down to show you how I got this as an anchor point. First, the word reasonable, which we see here in the text, at the case in the Greek, means to be gentle, to be gracious, to be forbearing. It describes conduct. The Theological Dictionary of the New Testament defines it this way, a seasoned man, a seasoned person that has matured, the reasonable man who stays within the limits of what is moderate and orderly. In other words, if we're going to stand firm, we have to understand how to conduct ourselves. Paul said in the first chapter of Philippians, Philippians 127, he says, conduct yourselves in a manner, how? Worthy of the gospel. There is an aspect to standing firm that requires us to be people who exercise careful conduct. He said, all right, well, how did you get the adjective observable, observable reasonableness? Well, do you see this imperative known? It's the fourth imperative, gnosko. He says, make it known. Let your reasonableness be known. The command is an outward demonstration of a reasonable conduct. You see, this idea of, of, of to know or to or be known or the concept of gnoso is the state of being. Your state of being ought to be of reasonableness. It's a command. Remember growing up as a, a young boy, I think I was under the age of 10, my mother would occasionally drop me off at my grandfather's home. Lived in the same city as we did and uh, I had a deep fondness for my grandfather. And he always seemed to have a couple friends around the house, two of them that I remember quite clearly. One was named Tubby Wilson, and Tubby actually resembled his nickname. He was, a, he was a rather large man. And then there was another gentleman, his name was Frank. I don't recall his last name. Tubby was a gentleman. Frank was a curmudgeon. That's the best way I can define He seemed to always be in a bad mood. And of course, I like to keep my distance from Frank, and I would usually pal around with Tubby. And I, as I got older, I, I, I started to think more highly of Tubby Wilson. He was, he was just a gracious man to a young boy. Have you ever noticed that as people age, some people tend to get increasingly less reasonable? Have you ever noticed that? There's an awful lot of Franks in the world. 
a lot of curmudgeons that become less and less patient, and less and less reasonable, and less and less kind. They become cranky and grouchy. I wonder why is that? I mean, th think about it. Sh shouldn't it be the opposite? I mean, if we look at the definition of reasonableness, especially from the theological diction in the New Testament, a seasoned person, a seasoned man or woman, someone who has been through life, someone who has walked with the Lord, should we not expect that they are actually people who are more patient, more reasonable, more kind? How do we get that way? Well, by practicing patience and reasonableness and kindness now. It's a practice. It's a spiritual discipline. It's a command out of the text. Oh, that we might be more like the Tubby Wilsons of the world and less like the old curmudgeon Frank. Which are you? Well, how do we practice observable reasonableness? Well, let me just give you some things out of the scriptures. First, guard your words carefully. Your words tend to indicate what you are thinking and feeling and how you are responding to life overall. James 1.19, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger, for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Did you see the formula? Quick, slow, slow. Quick, slow, slow. Quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Someone once said that uh, the Lord gave us two ears so that we might be quick to hear, but he only gave us one mouth so that we might be slow to speak. Guard your words carefully. It demonstrates whether or not you are a reasonable person. Second, check your demeanor. Ephesians 4.32, Paul says, Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ has forgiven you. Check your demeanor. Is it following a biblical standard? Third, exercise patience. I use the word exercise strategically. What do you do when you exercise? You practice something. You work on something. This is the aspect of reasonableness that might need to be practiced. It's the idea of exercising it on a regular basis. Ephesians 4 says, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit. I have to wonder if those that we looked at in the very first couple verses, Judea and Syntyche, if they had a, if one of them or both of them perhaps had problems with reasonableness, they were not exercising patience with one another. Fourth, be selfless. Paul is the one who's already taught us this. This is to be more concerned with others than yourself. Philippians 2, 3, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. That's how I always felt when I was around Tubby Wilson. He was interested in me. He was more concerned with me as a young boy than he as an older man. More concerned with me than himself. Be selfless. Five, practice contentment. Now when you hear the word contentment, you might be thinking of material contentment, but it can be far more in depth than just the material contents of our life. The idea of contentment is a life mentality. Remember what Paul said in Philippians 4. He says, I know how to be brought low. I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger and abundance and need. What's the secret? The secret was to be content with the present state. Many times what happens 
to remove reasonableness in our own life is that we're not content with our present state. And so what do we do? We practice contentment. Now these are just five simple practical ways to build reasonableness in our, into our lives. You, you could add another five, another five onto that. Keep going throughout the scriptures to learn that our conduct truly does matter. And that as your conduct goes, so does your ability or your inability to stand firm. And so what do we do? We guard our reasonableness. Now why are we reasonable? Well, do you notice verse 5? Because the Lord is at hand. Literally, this is the Lord is near. Now this term can mean near as in time. In other words, the Lord is coming soon. Or this could be near as in space. The idea of a spatial reality. In other words, the Lord is literally close to you. Now, which one is it? Well, I, I, I tend to agree with the scholars and those who are the writers of commentaries when it says that this should be understood in a spatial sense. That the Lord literally is near to us. Like in Psalm 119, 51, or 151 that says, but you are near, O Lord. Spatially near. When, when you have need, his strength is near. When you need his presence, he is near. When you need his assurance, he is close to you. When you are fearful, he is near to you. When you are out of resources, he comes alongside. When you are worried, he is near to you. Now what is the result of knowing that the Lord is near? Well look at verse 6. It says, the Lord is at hand, the Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything. This is our fifth imperative out of our group of seven. Do not be anxious. Again, a command. You hear what Paul is saying? It's a command from the Lord not to worry. The command from the Word of God is to not be anxious. And it literally means to not be troubled. And there's an even, uh, even a, a secondary sense of internal trouble. Don't allow yourself to become internally anxious or worried. Now have you ever considered the practical reality of that command? Some of us worry more than others. But it's a command. I want to help you live out that command. So let's think through logically the passage before us in terms of worry and anxiety. Have you ever, have you ever considered the theological foolishness of worry? If you think about it in terms of theology, I'm not, I'm not talking about about worry because we can't change anything, that's fatalistic. No, I'm, I'm talking to, about not worrying because theologically we know what? Well, look at the passage. God is at hand. God is near. If we really believe God is near, if he's spatially present with us, then there really is not a need to be anxious or to worry. Now we have a choice about anxiety and about worry. We can be very pragmatic about it. And we can try to find mechanisms to help us to not worry. I was uh, on Amazon uh, this week looking in their book section and just doing a, a search on the, on the topic of worry and anxiety. Here are the top four best sellers in this particular genre. How to Stop Worrying and Start Living, number one. How to Trick Your Mind into Not Worrying. The Worry Cure, Seven Steps to Stopping Worry. And then the final, the Anxiety and Worry Workbook. <laughs> I don't need to work. I worry your anxiety. Now look, we can come up with clever solutions we can try to be very pragmatic about this. Or we can 
rest in the reality that our God is near and practice the theology that we believe. You see, what this comes down to is not clever techniques. It doesn't come down to simple formulas on how to stop worrying or how to stop being anxious. It's understanding the reality of a relationship with our Heavenly Father. He says that He is near to us. I'm under the persuasion to drive you to God. The more you understand God's attributes, the more you understand God's character, the more you understand His grandeur, the more you understand His sovereignty, the more you understand the theological ramification of who it is that we follow after, the less likely we'll have to concoct formulas so that we don't worry or be anxious people. You say, well, how do you go about understanding the nearness of God? Psalm 1-1 comes to mind. Many of you probably have already put it to memory. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinner, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. Here's the transition. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. There it is. How do you know the nearness of God? How do you know the attributes of God, the character, the grandeur, the sovereignty of God? You spend time in his word. And what is the result? He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season. And its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. What does that sound like? Someone who stands firm. You see, we stand firm in the Word of God. Following the Word of God helps us to understand not only what we should be doing, but who it is that we're doing it for. The reality is we're not doing this for ourselves. We're doing this to honor and glorify and worship our Heavenly Father. He's near to you. Practice this theologically and it will end the battle of anxiety and worry. Now the scriptures are pragmatic about what we should do in drawing near to God. Notice, as we continue on in the middle of verse 6, the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. There is the practicality of how to end worry. It's not only theologically the knowledge that God is near, but listen, it's taking advantage that God is near. And what do you do? You go to him in prayer. In fact, what we're going to call dependent prayer as an anchor point for us to stand firm. We must be people to pra be practicing dependent prayer. There are three words that describe dependent prayer. Did you catch them? It's the word prayer supplication and thanksgiving. Now they all lead to the idea of a request, a petition, an asking, an appeal. What is the first thing that you do when you are anxious? You make a request to God, knowing that he is near, that he hears you. Now what does this look like? Well, let's break down these three words. First, the word prayer. Now we could go into depth to this very simple Greek word, but you know what it what it is, it's the simplest form of communication with God. It's simply talking with God. It's the regular communion with God. It was uh, this last Thursday morning with our campus pastors. We meet every Thursday morning to spend time praying and discussing and planning. And many times we are off on a rabbit trail for some time. It's just a part of the community of the pastors joining together, and we were discussing prayer, and being somewhat transparent about our own prayer lives. And Mike Costelli was 
Speaking about Mike, by the way, for those of you who might not know, is the lead pastor at our Green Campus. Speaks there, has been doing a wonderful job. Mike was just saying that his regular practice is ongoing communion with God. He, he seeks to be always praying. And we were asking him, well, how, how do you do this? And he says, it's just an ongoing open dialogue that I'm having with the Lord from the moment I get up and throughout the rest of the day. And as he was describing this, I was thinking of the, the study I had been doing in prayer that week, and I, I realized that he was just, he, he was characterizing the very essence of the word prayer. It means just an ongoing di dialogue, a simple communication with God, a simple conversation. How do we overcome worry and anxiety? We're in constant communication with a God that is near. The second word is the word supplication. That is to make your needs known. To make the needs that you have known. Don't be fearful to tell the Lord exactly what it is that you are dealing with. Work it through with Him throughout your day. There is no harm in bringing it up repeatedly. This is the aspect of an ongoing relationship with the Lord that is at hand. And then the last word, it's the word thanksgiving. And this is a familiar word, eucharisto in the Greek. It means to be grateful. The Eucharist is the prayer of gratefulness for Christ. Now pull all of this together and what are we doing? We are being dependent on God. We're not coming up with formulas. We're not thinking of strategic ways not to worry, not to be anxious. We are being dependent on God. We're making known our needs. We're trusting God. Now think about that in the terms of Scripture. We trust God. He'll supply every need according to His riches. Philippians 4. We trust God by casting all of our anxiety on Him because we know He cares for us. 1 Peter 5. We trust God because he makes all grace abound, 2 Corinthians 9. We trust God because he has the power and the authority. He is sovereignly in control, Matthew 28, 18. We trust God that he works all things for good, Romans 8. You see, we are people who are theologically grounded in the word of God. And when we ground ourselves in the Word of God, worry and anxiety dissipate because we trust the God who is near. We notice the result of living this lifestyle of trust. Verse 7, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. What kind of peace is, is this? It's not a human peace, is it? I mean, look at the text. Look how it describes it. It's a divine peace, a transcendent peace, an unexplainable peace. Like Isaiah 26, you keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Perfect peace. Where does perfect peace come from? It comes from a divine source. There's no explanation for this kind of peace. It's not manufactured. It's, it's not a technique. It does not come from man. It does not come from this life. Where does it come from? It comes from the peace of your heavenly Father. And what will it do? Notice, it will guard your heart and mind. This word guard, you know what this word is? It's a military word. Do you remember what we said when we first started understanding this, this, this passage as a whole? That Paul is using military motif all the way through. He tells us to stand firm. That's a military sense of standing your post, being ready, being on guard. Why? Because we're in a spiritual battle. Now he's using a military word, the idea that the guarding of what? Of our very lives comes from God. It guards this peace, guards our hearts, our lives, our minds. This is the whole you. 
Guards against what? Guards against anxiety. You see, we're still feeding off of that, of that command, do not be anxious. He's teaching us how not to be anxious. It all starts by trusting God, expressing that through prayer. I trust God, I pray, I leave it with Him. I trust God, I pray, I leave it with Him. Now I have to point out one very interesting fact in this whole passage. You might not have noticed it. It came to me quite late as I was studying this passage. But you notice that there is no sense of answer to our requests. There's no promise of an answer. You see this? He says, the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication and thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God. Now you would assume that what follows next is that the Lord will answer. You're asking, you're expecting an answer. Right? We do that with our children. We ask something of our children, we're expecting an answer. It drives me crazy when I ask my children and then they don't answer. So, Did you hear me? Did you hear me? I'll just say that until I get a response. I'm finding that the older that they are and the more they're wired into technology, I can text them and call them and they will not respond. So I text them and call them. They do not respond. I have a friend whose son is away at college. He says, it gets worse once they're out of your house. <laughs> they go off to college, you can't. I said, well, what do you do? No, he says, that's easy. I just send a text that I'm no longer gonna be sending them money until they <laughs> call me back. Oh, that's good. <laughs> he says, it's remarkable, they call almost right away. That's the sense of it. When you make a request, you expect an answer, right? Well, the text clearly indicates that we are to make a request to God. But God does not promise an answer. What does he promise? Peace. I found that extremely comforting. You know why? Because sometimes the answers create more anxiety. We don't need the answer. We need the peace of knowing that God is near and He's in control. Remember the scripture? This is like, the Word of God is a lamp unto our feet. It's not a spotlight that shows the whole way, it's a lamp unto our feet, our next step. You see, what we need is not answers. We need peace. And this is exactly what he promises us. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds. By the way, that's the whole you in Christ Jesus. This is what we need. This is what we're desperate for. Are any of you struggling with anxiety and worry this morning? Is there something that you're playing over and over again in your mind and you can't seem to let it go? Do you find that there is a reoccurring battle with the uncertainty of what's next? Does it seem to be ever consuming the last thing you think of when you go to bed and the very first thing you think of when you wake up in the morning, that's all consuming anxiety and worry. For others of you, it might not be that drastic. It might ebb and flow in your life where you find that it is at stages you're, you're worried and you're legitimately concerned, but it, it's because things are outside of your control. But nonetheless, 
you worry, you have anxiety? Why don't we rest in the theology that we know that God is at hand? Why don't you rest in the reality that your Heavenly Father loves you and is in complete control of your life? There's not one maverick molecule outside of God's control. Rest in that reality. And that he calls you to walk with him arm in arm as the lamp is to your feet, step by step. Let's stop worrying about that which we cannot control or that which we do not know and rest in that which we do know. Today we're going to end our services just a bit differently. I'm going to invite our pastors and those who are part of our prayer team to come and stand along the front. And I'd like you to do that now. And I'm going to give you an opportunity to come and pray with these men and women and to leave it here today. So they're going to be standing across the front and I will be down front as well. And before you slip out this morning, if you're carrying anxiety and the burdens of worry, why don't you come and leave it here today? Give it to the Lord and wait for his perfect peace. Don't seek the peace, seek the Lord. He's the giver of the peace. And ask that as your mind, as your emotions take over, ask again, Lord, remind me that you are near to rest in that. And give me your perfect peace. If you'd like to pray with any of these men or women, just slip out and come down front and pray. We're going to be here. The rest of you, I'd ask if you quietly slip out the back doors so that as people are coming forward, we have opportunities to pray with them, take them before the Lord. Let's all stand together. We'll pray. And if you'd like to come at the end of the service, you slip out and come forward. The rest of you, quietly make your way out the back doors. Father, thank you for the reality and the truth of the Word of God. Thank you that we do not have to manufacture a way not to worry or a way not to be anxious. But that you take care of that. Then our simple relationship with you, of trusting that you are close at hand, that you are near. Pray for those who will be coming forward, that today is a day they leave the worry and the anxiety. And they trust in you, a God that is near. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. This has been a message from The Chapel in Akron, Ohio. For more information about The Chapel or to listen to more of these types of life-applicable messages, please go to our website at thechapel.life.